Okay, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alexander Hernandez, a research analyst at the McNair Center for Entrepreneurship and Economic Growth at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. I will be the moderator for today's discussion. The McNair Center focuses on public policy related to private enterprise in the areas of economic growth, government regulation, tax policy, and access to capital. Entrepreneurs and business owners in the United States face many obstacles securing capital to start, operate and grow their businesses. The emerging use of technology, of blockchain technology in financial services has the potential to transform a small business lending and improve capital access for business excluded by conventional lending processes. Additional applications of blockchain technology can also enhance business operations and create more opportunities for growth. Here with us today are our distinguished panelists. First, Spencer Randall, principal and co-founder of the cryptocurrency analysis and rating agency CryptoEQ. He's also the director of RISE and alumni entrepreneurs and innovators. Also, we have Clev Mesidor, who leads the national policy network of women of colors in, blo in blockchain and is a public policy advisor to the Blockchain Association. And I'll, at least, last but not least, Shulolit Mukherjee. Vice President and Global Head of Tax at Binance US. We will begin by hearing briefly from our panelists about what cryptocurrency is, how it is regulated, and how it is taxed in the United States. After we cover the basics, we will take a closer look of the opportunities that cryptocurrency is offering to entrepreneurs, and how regulatory and tax policy can support those opportunities. We also have 10 minutes reserved at the end of the webinar for any questions for the audience and for our panelists. Once we reach that point, please write your questions in the chat and we will try to answer as many as we can in the time allowed. Now, I am very excited to begin we will start with Spencer. So Spencer, in about two minutes, can you give us an overview of the basics of blockchain and cryptocurrency? I realize, realize that that is ask, asking a lot. Thank you for having me, Alex. Uh, it's uh, blockchain and, and crypto have really grown to be the trillion dollar question, the trillion dollar word. Um, you know, over the last decade, Publicly traded cryptocurrencies have grown to over $2 trillion in market cap. Um, and these markets are made up of what can be more broadly described as distributed ledger technologies, or DLT for short. Um, within DLT, you have blockchain technology. And blockchain is the specific innovation and breakthrough that makes the largest cryptocurrencies what they are today. I'd like to share more context on what's happening at scale here and, and the changes that we're seeing in the world. Um, if you think about market cap of different assets, um, gold is something on the order of 11 trillion. Uh, household names like Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon are on the order of 2 trillion. Bitcoin itself is approximately 1 trillion in market cap. And Ethereum is about 500 billion in market cap. So we have, we've seen these, these assets grow in valuation uh, over the past decade. But what exactly is a blockchain? What exactly is powering this? Uh, why is Bitcoin described as the internet of money? Why is Ethereum potentially the evolution of the internet? Um, a blockchain can be thought of as an accounting ledger containing a record of the balances and transactions on a given network. The blockchain itself is a linear series of blocks tied together by cryptography. Distinguishing features of a blockchain and what makes it unique are that it's peer-to-peer uh, that it's a tamper-proof ledger. And each cryptocurrency, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, 
have different qualities uh, and how they create, communicate, uh, and apply the ledger. Um, so what does all this mean in a sentence? You know, why is blockchain changing the world? A sufficiently decentralized, scalable, and secure blockchain disrupts traditional intermediaries and gatekeepers, and it provides an opportunity for more open peer-to-peer -peer systems. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Now what, that we know the basics of blockchain and crypto, Cliff, what is the current federal regulatory framework for cryptocurrency and what are some of the challenge with that framework? Yes, well, thank you for having me on. <clears throat> this is an important conversation. Unfortunately, the current federal regulatory framework is uncertain, right? So one thing that you know the audience should walk away with knowing is that the cryptocurrency and blockchain space is regulated. It is currently regulated and they have to comply with AML, KYC compliance exchanges are we actively reporting to the IRS. So the regulatory conversation is not about that, right? It is not about you know people not paying their taxes or out of compliance. It is really about the lack of a roadmap a roadmap for innovation to actually move forward, right? So right now, you know, between the regulatory agencies like the SEC, the CFTC, and even Congress, the 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 committees that have oversight over these 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 regulatory agencies, you know, it, there's so much there's lack of clarity about what's a security, what's a commodity, you know, how do we determine, you know, how we regulate exchanges, and and right now the big conversation is around DeFi and stable coins. There's a lot of uncertainty. The the president has a working group, it's a White House working group on financial markets. You know, they are slated to put out a, a report on stable coins to actually start to provide that roadmap soon, and you know. Secretary Gensler, who considers himself a, a top cop on the beat, which, you know, again, lots of uncertainty when it comes to that, because, you know, when you force, when you seek to foster in innovation, you know, that can be very intimidating. But Secretary Gensler testified, you know, on Capitol Hill yesterday before the House Financial Services Committee. He, recently, he, he was before the House Senate Committee. And you know he's expressed a lot of concern about consumer protections, and also in terms of how you know the, again the DeFi space is evolving. But you know the regulatory framework is going to take time. There are now probably you know about thirty or forty active bills in the House and the Senate moving forward. The most important one right now is the House Infrastructure Bill, which has that you know last minute cryptocurrency tax provision that was added by the Biden administration in the pay for section for the infrastructure bill. The vote has been delayed. We, you know, Secretary Pelosi has indicated that, you know, by the end of October, there should be a vote. We will see. But I, I do want to say that what we've seen at the state level is encouraging. At the state level, we do see, you know, policymakers and even regulators coming to consensus about, you know, what is needed, right? And what is that path forward? And even talking about things like regulatory sandbox. You know, yesterday, in light of Secretary Gensler's, you know, testimony, we did have, you know, Congressman McHenry from the House Financial Services Committee, he introduced the bill that really moved forward, you know, a concept by Secretary, well, Commissioner Hester Pierce, who actually introduced this concept of a safe harbor for you know stablecoin insurers, digital token insurers. And so the bill is called the Clarity for Digital Tokens Act, you know, moves that conversation forward and talks about you know this, you know, the safe harbor, you know, this three-year period for you know token issuers and what that could be. Again, all of this lack of clarity makes it so that if you're a startup founder, if you're an entrepreneur about to build a business, you're about to, you know, create an NFT project or a DeFi project, you have no idea what the landmines are, right? You you get an attorney, but the 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 bar can move, you know, by the time you launch, and then you're out of compliance, and that's not a, a way to actually grow the innovation economy. Thank you, Clef. It's a, a transition that we are with this kind of, uh, you know, process. And Shuloli, 
Can you give us an overview of how cryptocurrency is taxed in the United States? Sure, and um, thanks for having me on here. I mean, I think I think Clef sort of hit the the biggest challenge on the head over there is that there has been and continues to be a lot of um, uncertainty. Uh, we, you know, Binance US is one of the regulated exchanges. Um, you know, we continue to wait for Treasury and IRS to release regs, which have now been promised through two administrations. <laughs> um, but but at the same time, we know um, that they have a box on the Form 1040 that most people complete, which used to be on the second page as to whether you've had any um, interactions with the crypto um, you know, industry or whatever, have you bought crypto or sold it? And now they moved it to the first, first page, which shows that uh, for those of us who've been in the tax world for a long time, those things don't happen um, very often. But I think the other thing that Clef pointed out, which is important uh, and, and causes confusion is there are various agencies that call crypto various classes of assets. CFTC calls it a commodity, SEC calls it something else, and the IRS has maintained that it is indistinguished property. What does that mean? So basically when you, it's like, you know, if you're buying widgets, right? So if you, if you buy crypto and just hold it in your wallet, that itself is not a taxable event. It only becomes, and I'm not going to go into things like hard forks and airdrops and everything because we just don't have time for that, but in general. Um, but if you then sell it, then you have capital gains. And in, in that particular case, the, the rules of capital gains is, is very much similar to the traditional financial world, right? Um, so, so that's kind of how you, you get the income. Uh, note, however, that because the, the IRS has only uh, released about two notices, one F FAQ um, and another notice initially back in 2014, there is not a requirement on regulated exchanges to actually provide year-end reporting either to the customers or users um, or the IRS. So for example, if you had a broker account at Schwab and you, you know, bought and sold securities at the end of the year, you get something called a 1099B, B stands for broker dealer. Um, there's no requirement to do that. Um, so various exchanges have reported on different forms thinking, okay, this is like the closest you can get. But again, there's no directive to do that. So um, the second thing is that, uh, however, there are some areas where there is a 1099 requirement for, in the US, which is you know, things like staking. Um, and there are some programs that exchanges run where you, know, you can watch a video and earn crypto. If that uh, cumulative amount um, goes north of $600, then it's, it's deemed to be miscellaneous income, right? So, then you will get a 1099 miscellaneous at the end, end of the year. Um, but what is important right now uh, is we need clarity. We need uh, the infrastructure bill has its own challenges, uh, which, in, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit later. But um, just to remember that one is mainly capital gains income, unless it's one of those rewards, right, like um, that I just spoke about. Um, but then the other thing to notice is that just because you don't get a tax form at the end of the year does not mean that income from crypto is that that you don't you as a user or a customer don't have the responsibility to report the income on crypto so the exchanges may not be directed to send you something formal but you still need to keep track of how much you bought your crypto for and then how much you sold it for and thereby be able to either yourself or your accountant or whoever be able to um, calculate whether you had a gain or a loss from the sale of crypto. And that in itself is where the income and the taxation happens. Thank you, Shulolit. Um, that is very important that we have to take our responsibility as well as a trader, investor and entrepreneurs. And Spencer, why would a small business owner in this situation and with these opportunities, owner turn to the cryptocurrency? It's a great question. Uh, yeah, I'd like to start by saying that I see Rice, um, you know, I'm a Rice alumni, and by extension, the United States uh, as a global leader in innovation. And I also see small business owners, entrepreneurs, and new venture as an essential part of any innovation in any innovation ecosystem. Uh, so I just want to stress to the audience how vital I think small business and new venture is to uh, not only the United States, but the evolution of the world as we know it. Uh, these are the folks that dive in and you know are literally putting 
a lot of their assets and, and taking a lot, on a lot of the risks to change the world. Um, and so the system, as I see it now, in terms of access to capital, is one that is full of friction um, and gatekeepers. And so what I think is really interesting that can happen here uh, with blockchain specifically, and its peer-to-peer -peer nature, is opening up the system and opening up access to capital. Um, so the system, as it can be, with a, a compliant blockchain base layer, is one that can be more fluid, um, with less gatekeepers, and more objective allocation of, of capital. Um, so when you see things rising up, like I'll use this term loosely, crypto banks, um, where you can take your collateral, um, you know, digital assets, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and put them in the crypto bank to finance new venture, uh, you've increased access to capital for millions of people around the world. So with this digitally native generation that we have, uh, people that are growing up with the internet and are more comfortable with digital assets, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and other things like it uh, could be like a second nature to them, could feel more natural. And these folks can take that value, put it in a crypto bank and finance their efforts towards new venture. Uh, so, you know, in summary, I think that um, digital assets, especially for a digitally native generation, um, present an opportunity for a new kind of collateral um, and therefore a new means of financing new venture. Great. Cliff, what policies for blockchain and cryptocurrency is your organization promoting right now? Yes, <clears throat> I want to echo what Spencer said. You know, a small business continues to be the engine of America's economy, but our definition of small business has evolved, right? It has changed. Our mom and pops, our brick and mortar small businesses, they're innovating. They are leveraging, you know, emerging technologies like blockchain, like artificial intelligence, like, you know, virtual reality to actually innovate their businesses. But we need government to keep up because the evolving small business and entrepreneurship landscape, you know, is innovative, is, you know, leveraging these technologies and government can just, you know, government seems to be putting so many roadblocks in place. At the end of the day, crypto is here to stay. And, you know, as I said before, the biggest takeaway I want, you know, the audience to leave with is the fact that people in crypto have to pay their taxes. The exchanges report them, right? Crypto is regulated. So the issue is not, are people paying their taxes? Are they regulating? The issue is, what is the roadmap? How are these conflicting regulatory agencies and house committees, you know, providing guidance that is actually consistent, that actually, so when you go to the CFTC, you don't hear something different when you go to OCC, you don't hear something different when you go to the Senate Banking Committee, you know, and so on and so forth. And now in terms of legislation, I, you know, I previously mentioned the Clarity for Digital Tokens Act that was just introduced by, by you know, McHenry, Congressman McHenry yesterday. And that actually focuses on the safe harbor, right? For, you know, for token issuers, this three year period that you don't have to worry about regulatory, you know, clampdowns to actually build. And that's where we have the innovation. You know, Obviously, you know, as I mentioned, there's quite a few bills in the House and the Senate. M many people may not know after the Senate fight over the infrastructure bill and the crypto provision, Senator Toomey put out a, a request for proposals. He asked folks for their ideas of legislative policies broadly for crypto, share them. And, you know, for my organization, the National Policy Network of Women of Color, I joined with 13 other Black, Latinx, Asian women of color, LGBTQ folks, you know, leaders in the industry to actually put, you know, send a presentation, a package to Senator Toomey. And the package included, you know, one of the one of the recommendations was innovating the SBA 7A loan program. It seems small, but most entrepreneurs today are not going to get VC funding, right? So we need these, you know, op options to be accessible. And we have not innovated the 7A loan program in forever. And it is one of the most flexible, you know, loan programs there. And we're suggesting a pilot program, not just for blockchain, but also for AI, for VR, for robotics, so that we can actually start innovating these processes. I've, and also, you know, one of the pieces of legislation was providing for the SEC has a SEC 
FinTech Hub and Lab CFTC at the CFTC. These are hubs that are there to really connect with the with the ecosystem, entrepreneurs and startups. And you know, we think that they should have a diversity mandate, right? That there should be a mandate for them to be able to to outreach more, so that you know we can really diversify policy making. I wear another hat. I'm an advisor to the Blockchain Association, Binance US that Raj is from is a member company. And the Blockchain Association submitted a proposal to Senator Toomey as well. So there's a lot of ideas there. At the heart of all of them is, you know, how do we make it easier for small businesses and entre entrepreneurs to innovate? But also, how do we resource small businesses and entrepreneurs in a better way, especially with the existing tools that we already have? Thank you, Cliff. I, I'm pretty sure that we have that hope that to find a neutral way to coexist together and get positive way. Uh, because as you said, this is to stay, you know? So, okay, Shulalit, what indications do we have from the federal government and RERS on where crypto tax action is headed here? Well, that's, uh, shall we say, the $27 billion question. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's enough people that have heard about all the, all the confusion and commotion around the infrastructure bill that, that Clev mentioned, right? Um, and there are many facets in there. I think, you know, I think I'm safe to say it was put together in a bit of a rush. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Clev mentioned, I, we're part of the Blockchain Association and we, um, our tax working committee, which I co-chair, um, we did intervene and try to suggest uh, many amendments to to this particular um, effort, um, which you know at the end of the day didn't really quite get through. But nonetheless, we'll try. But I, I think there are two things there that that need need to be highlighted. Um, one is there in the language there tries to expand the definition of who is a broker, right? Which is huge because remember there's already comprehensive rules in the regular security securities market, whether it's taxation or reporting requirements for brokers. The question is, will the same thing apply to the crypto world, which doesn't always, are not, the actors are not exactly um, fitted to the type of actors you see in a traditional securities market, right? Now, as we've already mentioned, and, and Clef has mentioned, the regulated exchanges like Binance US or Kraken or what have you, um, they are going to fall under these broker dealer reporting rules. There's no, there's no reason why they shouldn't, they're regulated, they already collect KY, AML, KYC information. Uh, so, so once those rules are in place, there will likely be a 1099B or some, something similar to be re reported to the user and the IRS based on, on, on income numbers, right? The more challenging areas are those actors within the crypto uh, ecosystem that don't quite fit those molds, like miners and market makers and DeFi exchanges and smart contracts. And there's a widespread differences of opinion um, on this subject and who should be in scope and who should be out of scope. And I think that conversation continues as this bill is going through the house. And I think it will continue thereafter as well till, till US Treasury um, issues the proposed regulations. The second big thing that we saw there is, as I had mentioned in, in the answer to my previous question, the IRS has always maintained that crypto was property. What we saw for the first time in this particular bill is the mention of reclassifying the asset type to security uh, starting in 2023, which at a top level means that a lot of the information reporting and gathering rules that are valid for the regular securities market uh, now become relevant for crypto. Um, this is a huge change, both for the exchanges and anyone that's involved in the crypto world. And it's, it's important to say that even though 2023 seems like a long time away, for those of us that have been in the traditional finance uh, world and have dealt with major tax legislation changes, which require complete change of internal technology, you know, transaction systems and flags and all of that, having 12 months before we have to collect all this information is really not a lot of time. But what seems to be clear to me is that the government wants to know and wants to know more information about crypto transactions and the whole blockchain architecture, which is fine as long as they formulate reasonable policies and rules, right? Part of the challenge is that the government is using traditional reporting rules and to the traditional tax sensibilities um, that have been developed over the last say 50 years 
to, to collect information about a dynamically different and fast innovating industry. So I do have some empathy for those that have to come up with these regulations, uh, but at the same time, you know, they have to be very cognizant that they're dealing with a very different animal here. So what the industry has been doing, and, and Claire mentioned this, and, and continues to do is to have productive dialogue with the SEC, with the IRS, Treasury, um, and even up on the Hill to help them understand this new landscape. Um, and, and my hope is that uh, with this continual engagement, the rules that we're going to get at the end of the day uh, will serve both purposes. It'll have the necessary information that the government needs, but also not be inhibitive to uh, to this, you know, growing and and frankly uh, important part of uh, of the financial landscape, right? Finance 2.0, as we call it. And some of this is related to some of the things that you know people have already talked about: access to capital. Um, you know, I think the last financial revolution kind of left most people behind. Uh, and I think part of what crypto wants to do is to say, look, I mean, if you want to finance your business you, and have a smartphone and you can you can do it. Right. And I think that is important for for entrepreneurs. It's important for wealth distribution and it's important for innovation. Right. I think if you look at the finance world um, and tax world it's one of the few ones that have not really fundamentally changed in the last hundred years, right? And has really not used technology like many of the other areas. And this is, I think, is the next revolution where, you know, something that we use on a daily basis, technology is used to further um, people's opportunities. Great. I would like to ask each panelist to briefly answer these questions. What recommendation do you have for an entrepreneur that wants to get a start with cryptocurrency for the first time. Uh, so we're going to start with Spencer, then Cliff, and Shulalit. Another great question. Uh, I think that it's, it's, it behoove everyone to start uh, with learning, um, reliable resources, um, and, and learning more about what blockchain is, what digital assets are, what Bitcoin is, what Ethereum is, et cetera. Um, and I started uh, my journey by building a community to discuss crypto. Um, and out of that came a new venture and an idea for a new venture that was solving problems that we faced within that community. So for me, it started with reading and discussion. And uh, I have no affiliation with these three books, but I have three books that I think are great um, for people that want to learn more. The Bitcoin Standard is a book I've read cover to cover many times. Um, the Age of Cryptocurrency is another one that I recommend. And then lastly, uh, Crypto Assets is another book I've read cover to cover multiple times. These three books, I think, help provide a solid foundation for folks you know, that might be taking their first steps. Um, and thank you for, for the time and the question. Cliff? Yep, I'll go. So yeah, so I will echo what Spencer said that education, education, education is key. I first learned about Bitcoin when I was in the Obama administration. I was a presidential appointee at the Department of Commerce and a friend had a Bitcoin project in 2013. He asked me to help with a press release, never heard of Bitcoin. I did the press release, learned about Bitcoin. He had a wallet, I even opened a wallet, but I didn't do much with it until about 2015, 2016, until the conversation opened up to the applications like intellectual property protections and identity management that excited me. And then that's when I went down the rabbit hole around 2016. In 2017, I left my job, did this for, for real, for real. And I would tell you, it wasn't until about 2018 that I feel like I had a good grasp of this. And I, I launched a, a weekly newsletter that I do every Monday. And I it's still years later, it still goes out every Monday to thousands of people. The learning curve for crypto is high. Right? It, 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 depends, it depends on your relationship with money, but it also requires a different way of thinking about how we transact, right? So therefore, you know, people, I tell people, don't let FOMO drive you into crypto. The space is in its infancy, is the perfect time to do the, your due diligence learn, you know, find the resources. The books that we just mentioned are great. One that I love, I love, I love people to start with is The Internet of Money. It's written by Andreas Antonopoulos. I butchered his last name. But The Internet of Money really takes us through the journey of how long we've been trying to digitize money and to the modern time. And it really gives you a really good hands-on about this whole concept of, you know, what's real and what's not. But, but you know, there are... Going to you know, trusted sources is important. 
YouTube is so, 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 you know, busy and clouded and noisy, I do think that people should take time to find, you know, resources that they trust. But first and foremost, start with education. And most importantly, start with your sector, wherever you write. If you're a nurse, focus on how it's impacting nursing and, and medicine, right? If you're, you know, uh, whatever you are. So don't try to, this, the depth and the breadth of this can be overwhelming, but start small and then build out. Lalit. Yeah, I think uh, I'll say from my from my perspective in my world, right, one of the things that people don't want to think about is taxes, right? I mean, who wants to think about taxes? But, but th there are some, as we've already discussed, there's a lot of uncertainty, there are some minefields, and especially for entrepreneurs who want to invest, or somebody wants to, you know, start their own mine, their own coin, or whatever, you know, small businesses, um, there is a tax tax requirement out there. And the IRS um, is, is sort of, in my opinion, um, kind of riding the cart before the horse a little bit. They, they, they're very focused on enforcement before um, clarification. So I would, uh, I would say that, you know, when you're looking at the whole picture of involvement and, and depends to the, to the degree that entrepreneurs or, or, or whoever wants to get involved in this, uh, in addition to what the other speakers have already mentioned, which I completely agree with, um, I think having a sound um, understanding of of how this works and a lot and and it, it's a moving target. It changes. There's innovation every day, but that's also the fun of it, right? Um, you also have to understand sort of the operational side of it because if you get heavily involved or if you create a small company that is heavily invested or if it's a you know it's a foundation that that wants to invest in crypto, there are other aspects that are boring to most people because but but the financial aspects of rules and regulations that also need to be taken into account. And you know you may either hire somebody or have someone consult with you, but don't leave that behind because that could come back and, and, and bite you and bite you pretty sharply. So that's what I would add to that. Thank you. Here is another one for each of you, just for a little bit of fun. Give me your best prediction about the future of cryptocurrency and how it will be used in the marketplace or how it will be regulated of taxes, whatever you like. And we're gonna switch the order from Shulali, then Cleve and Spencer. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be regulated. I can tell you that. And, the, and it's not just a US issue. The OECD is working on its regulations. Um, you know, Singapore and some of the other countries in Asia have, have worked on it. Um, so it's going to be regulated. The, the, the million dollar question is what will be the extent of those regulations, right? And, and I think it's going to be a moving target for a while because I think you'll see a lot of trial and error. You'll see proposed regulations, you'll see industry response to it. Uh, I'll see, I think you'll see transition periods. Um, so it, it's going to be a long game. Uh, I think that's, that's something that anyone that wants to be involved in crypto uh, should understand. I also think that, look, it's going to take time for the industry to grow, to grow and to diversify and to get things completely right. Look, look at how long it took for, you know, from a barter system to change into a monetary system, the silver standard versus the gold standard. You know, all these are major, major moments in finance history and world history, as a matter of fact, right? And so this thing has been around for seven or eight years. I mean, it's like it's not even a baby yet. You know, so so yeah, one has to give it time. One has to be open. -minded. Minded. And, and one has to understand that just as when we move from, hey, I, I give you potatoes and you give me salt to a, I give you money, a gold coins and you give me salt, that was a huge change in the human psyche. So is this one, but that was progress and it was allowed and look where we are today. So this is the next uh, stage in that and we must allow for that. And there's going to be friction. It's going to be two, three steps forwards, two, two steps back. Um, but this is where the engagement with those of us who, you know, are in the industry, who are subject matter experts, who, who live and breathe these things, can help the government sort of follow along and, and, and kind of like partner with them and so, that, so that we don't have prohibitive uh, rules and regulations um, for, you know, for what, what I consider is sort of the next, next big thing in finance. Thank you, Claire. I, I have to echo what Raj just said. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, and to, to use a wonky term, 
we are entering or in the fourth industrial revolution. This evolution that Raj just talked about in terms of the evolution of money, our relationship with money, it is reaching a tip tipping point and emerging technologies are driving it. When people talk about the fourth industrial revolution, it is the fact that robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, blockchain cryptocurrency are going to really impact how we interact, how we socialize and how we actually transact. And when you look at you know, the demographics of the world that's younger and browner, Decentralization makes sense to a younger demographic, right? And they are shifting, you know, where things are. And, you know, Raj just mentioned this friction. The friction is to be expected. The space is in its infancy. Everybody is rush, rush, rush. We need to take the time. So, you know, we need to have these regulatory conversations. But I will say, though, that, you know, and this is not criticism, the reason you see so much, you know, apprehension on Capitol Hill but you see so much optimism at the state level, it's because it's a generational thing to a large degree as well. A lot of the regulators and policymakers in Washington are, are baby boomers and they're protecting a financial system that makes sense to them. And, and it's a structure that they can govern under, right? So therefore, you know, but at the end of the day, you can't stop progress and you can't stop the shift from happening. Now, now, so that's my prediction that you know the 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 the, the policy regulations, as Raj men mentioned, this regulatory debate is happening globally. All nations are facing this. Some nations are going as far as banning it. You know, we had you know Jerome Powell put it on the record that he is not trying to ban crypto. But again, these res responses are trying to stop a movement that cannot be stopped. It is going to happen. And for those of us who are early in this space, this is our time to be responsible to build a, a truly an inclusive platform where everybody can participate, but also that makes sure that there's opportunity for those who are not able to participate before. Now, whenever people talk about predictions, we know what they want to know, right? What's going to be the price of Bitcoin? <laughs> And because of scarcity, we know that the price of Bitcoin is going to grow. A lot of people are predicting it. I, I, I think it's realistic to say that, you know, the price of Bitcoin within a year, probably sooner, will be 100,000. And it's not because it's a scam or a pump and dump. It's because of scarcity. And it's because of when you look at you know, when you look at cryptocurrency and the prices, some of them, you know, you're wondering like, what's the driving the price. But when you look at, you know, blockchains like Bit public blockchains like black like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you have to peel the onion. What's the developer community doing, right? What is that activity going? So when you look at, you know, the Bitcoin community and the store of value, you see, you know, the financial instruments that are building. You see a, a developer community that's protected of of this protocol. Same thing with Ethereum. When you see, you know, we. We can do we can you, we can leverage small contracts with Bitcoin. It just doesn't make sense. So Ethereum has really leveraged small contracts and really created this pathway to Web 3.0 and, and NFTs. And we see what's happened in gaming. So for people, you know, the the price of the cryptocurrencies that are most reputable, it's not something that's what's driving it. There's actually a whole developer community that's actually creating an in, in industry that is emerging that is going to not replace our coin society, but innovate it and make it better. Thank you, Cliff. We are waiting for that 100K from Bitcoin. <laughs> Spencer? Uh, <clears throat> excellent points by the other panelists. Um, uh, what I'll add to what they've already shared is I think the next chapter in crypto is one of integration. Um, so the question, you know, it's interesting, like you look at the range on the panel, our answers are, are have their own nuance and different. It's in, in different perspectives. I look at this as like, what does mass adoption look like? What do I think the next chapter looks like? And for years I felt, and, and this isn't how I felt when I, I joined this space five years ago, for the past few years, I felt like the next chapter looks like one of integration. And that uh, what we've already seen is large technology companies and large financial services companies, uh, companies like PayPal, companies like Twitter, companies like Visa are already integrating blockchain technology. Um, so I think in a sentence, um, what mass adoption looks like is the same front end with a new back end. Um, so I think that these technology companies and these financial services companies see the value proposition of crypto, uh, crave compliance, crave regulatory clarity, 
uh, want to integrate because it, it, to put it simply, it really can be helpful to their bottom line and it can re be, really be helpful to the end user. Um, so I think that to the audience, um, you know, the next chapter of crypto looks like you using the same apps with the same look and feel, uh, but the back end could be completely different um, and it should uh, increasingly be easier to use crypto. Um, it is a lot easier to use some of these service providers and products um, today than it was two years ago or five years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the rate of advancement and innovation is incredible. And um, I thank you again for the time. Thank you, Spencer. So now we are with um, the time of the Q&A. So we have some questions. I'm going to start with the first one here on the chat. Remember you all, if you have some question, take advantage and send us right now through the chat. So here, um, this is for Shulolit. So what have you seen regarding transfer pricing and international tax? You might, you might work in getting into your own common question. Yeah. So yeah, what, what have you been seeing Shulolit? Well, transfer, I, transfer pricing is a complicated tax issue to talk about in general, even with, with the tax folks. So, but I think where, where you see transfer pricing uh, come in as an issue, not an issue, but um, a subject is when you have foreign affiliates, right? So if, you, if you're dealing with um, uh, foreign affiliates and, and there are certain parts of your operations or what have you um, that uh, are shared between two countries, that's where there are rules to make sure that there's, you know, one, compliance agreements in place, the pricing is right. Uh, it's not per se a crypto issue. That's really more of a tax issue. Uh, it would, it would, uh, transfer pricing occurs even in the regular world. You know, I mean, I'll, you know, IBM's and 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 you know, IBM is a great great example, or or, or General Electric, where. You know, they have they have conglomerates around the world and they they share technology and they share service agreements and things like that so so in the international tax arena that that is part of what you have to assess for and all of that leads to you know your your work your provisional work and then um, finally your tax return right because you have to account for these um credits and and, and debits in your tax returns but um I think wh where I so I, I see transfer pricing as a kind of a separate, very kind of tax heavy issue. Um, I think where things are interesting is it will be a little bit more on the policy side, right? Which is relevant for, for, for your institution as well, is that the US, even though they're not part of the OECD, for example, right? The, but they are advisors to the OECD. So the US treasury has, has a big seat at the OECD. So when the OECD is, is trying to figure out if they're going to expand the common reporting standards, uh, which are basically the, uh, the the due diligence reporting requirements for tax multiple tax residents in in Europe and other OECD countries. Is about I think about hundred adopter countries. Um, they are thinking of expanding those due diligence rules, and and I've sat on many debates with with their working groups to say, okay, some countries want every bit of transaction information, some countries want a different kind of transaction information, and some of these countries like the UK, um, and Norway, um, and Singapore have already have their local requirements, right? I think that's where, and how does that reflect when? you know, US forms its own rules and these countries want to exchange these rules. So for example, what happens if a, you know, a British uh, resident in the United States who is a British citizen is heavily invested in, 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 in crypto and now the, the British government wants the IRS to exchange information. Now, this already happens in the traditional brokerage world, right? It's called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Um, but CRS came as a, as a second arm to that. Uh, so it remains to be seen from an international tax perspective how those conversations are going to happen and who's going to influence whom um, and, and where that ends up. Thank you. This is the second one from Scott Suhai. In regard, regards to raising capital in the past, you could do an ICO, but there were many challenges, including the SEC. Then there were security STOs, but you know they were expenses, and there is it also essentially for being public before having a release release product ready to the market. So he said that he heard from a 16 that they recommend raising the first round as convertible debt with a discount 
to either equity or tokens. What are all the models news for entrepreneurs should consider? Are the documents or articles that articulate the different strategies? This is for everyone who, who want to take. Um, I'll take the first crack at this one. Um, so uh, I completed an accelerator that I found really helpful. Again, no affiliation with this uh, organization. Y Combinator puts on um, a resource uh, called startupschool.org that aggregates, organizes, and helps educate entrepreneurs all around the world. Um, startupschool.org is a free resource. Anyone out there can jump on the platform and watch videos and download things that answer questions related to entrepreneurship. Uh, this particular question, I know they have some modules and segments where they walk through what it looks like raising your first dollar today, especially for technology companies. Um, I'm not going to touch uh, the ICO question or liquid tokens. I think there's other folks that are better suited on the panel to answer those questions. Uh, but I will say that uh, convertible debt seems to be the new standard um, for raising capital for new technology companies. Um, and that's, uh, that's startupschool.org is a resource where you can turn to to learn more and empower yourself um, to be more knowledgeable on this subject. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. So I school that org is one of them. And there are various accelerators that, you know, entrepreneurs can apply to that actually help you through that process in terms of understanding. And obviously, most of these programs are focused on VC funding, right? And we know that the challenges for the average entrepreneur to secure VC funding is difficult. So I'm one of those people who, you know, who advises entrepreneurs to bypass VC funding and to really look at, you know, crowdfunding and, you know, even other options like, you know, 7A loan program, especially for entrepreneurs who are bootstrapping that, you know, are pre-seed. You, know, you, you can spend so much time chasing down the dollar or, you know, the 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 person who asked the question mentioned STOs. You know the security token offerings. You know is part of the Jobs Act, and you know they have expanded that from one million dollars to five million dollars. I think it's a viable option. Yes, you do have to have a product to, but it allows you to raise money from anyone in the world. Right, and then and then obviously, right. The what we've seen with NFTs is creators, and the U.S. has a tremendous creative economy you know, leveraging, you know, creator tokens, NFTs to actually monetize their art, right, whatever their creations are. So there are alternatives to, you know, funding that we need to look at. And I do think that, you know, we, we need to start being honest about, you know, the numbers here and, 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 and how, you know, how much value VC funding is for actually entrepreneurs who are, you know, especially those who are looking to create something that is focused on, you know, addressing a social impact, you know, leading to some type of financial equity, you're not going to get a return on investment in two years, five years, which is what VC VC funders are looking for. So, you know, the, the question was pretty in depth, but I do think, you know, for the, the level of clarity that you're looking for, you, it's ideal to be in an accelerator or something like the startup school or so many other programs, but that would be my advice. I think people need to look beyond, you know, beyond VC funding. Thank you, Cliff. This is another one. Uh, franchising brands is more than a popular, but also can improve many vol volatile market environments. What is the trend now with this new currency in use? I see that AMC theaters now is going to accept crypto. It's open question. Can you clarify the question? Yeah, so I'm gonna repeat it. Franchising brands is more than a popular, but also can improve many volatile market environments. What is the trend now with this new currency in use? Oh, so it's sort of like franchising is a trend that has actually been, you know, a great way for entrepreneurs to launch a business without creating the business. And so, well, I, I think with, if I'm understanding the question, you know, within the crypto space, I think one of the, one of the most mainstream, you know, trends to point to that people understand is NFTs. Right. It is where, you know, the 
we have creators who, you know, whether they're in music or art or, you know, literature or whatever, you know, the revenue they've actually made over the last you know, a few years is tremendous and more than they probably made in the last decade. So I would say, if I'm understanding the question correctly, in terms of one of the trends that we see people leveraging to, you know, monetize their assets, you know, leverage their creativity. I do think what we've seen in the NFT space has been exciting. You know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of places to go learn about this, OpenSea, Nifty Gateway, where you can actually purchase you know, NFTs, but, you know, there's so many young people out there that are just creating their own NFTs and leveraging their network to make money. But there's also a lot of other trends as well. But I do think, you know, when you look at, you know, gaming and how, you know, Ethereum is being leveraged for that, that has been really exciting. But, you know, I think there are lots of great examples in terms of mainstream trends that are really attracting mainstream consumers, entrepreneurs, and, and founders. Thank you, Cliff. This is another one from Madison Prowse. Which coins or protocol do you recommend to develop a, a startup? Is Ethereum a good choice? Uh, I'll answer that question with a question. Um, is a, a token absolutely necessary for your business? Um, you know, that we've, we've uh, between the panel, I'm sure we've all seen thousands of uh, tokens come and go. Um, so, so my question back would, um, is the problem that you're solving, does it fundamentally have to have a token? Um, and if, if you can't explain that and, and defend that, um, it probably doesn't. So, uh, Happy to, to do some follow-up there too, if that person would like to reach out directly. Thank and you, I, Spencer. And I'll totally echo that, that, you know, so many people are being driven by FOMO. Cryptocurrency, blockchain, it's not a one-stop shop, a solution, a silver bullet for anything. It's actually technology that helps people to solve problems that you don't have to be, you know, a, a blockchain founder or startup, you can just be a regular person that has a problem and a protocol or application could actually be helpful. So I really echo that last comment from Spencer. All right. So we are can I just take can I just take one minute to say to say something. So I think I think one of the things that all of us, all three of us and panelists have have emphasized is this is a new world, right? And I think that it's important to understand the fundamentals of this world, uh, because because it's it's it is like learning a new trade. It is like learning uh, something that you haven't learned before. And and I think whatever the methodology that you choose, whether it is what Spencer was suggesting certain books, or you want to you know you're just better at YouTubing thing, or or what have you, or, or going on Reddit, or whatever it is, find your lane of sound information. And, 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 you know, the other thing that, that um, Spencer pointed out, which is, which is a very important question, what is it that you're trying to resolve? Or what is it that you're trying to solution? Or what is it that you're trying to innovate, right? It's not just about whether you want to make money or not make money. And if that's your goal, that's fine too. But there are plenty of, plenty of books out there in the traditional market that talks, talk about strategy. So I think, I think it's important to understand how blockchain works. It's important to understand what the pitfalls are. It's important to understand some of the uh, challenges that we may not see on a regular basis because what's flashing in the headlines is, is that Bitcoin is $65,000 or one day and 80 or you know what have you. So I think like in any other um, endeavor, in any other process that's new and that you want to be involved in, um, you can only benefit by educating yourself on the full spectrum of what is required to minimize um, any of the pitfalls and also learn from, from the community, right? Because one of the fundamental differences between the blockchain community and what I would say traditional finance is what defines market edge? Generally, if you think of large banks, they define their market edge by something they have that they don't want to share with anybody, a product type that they have that they don't want to, and, and they'll be the first to the market and therefore they will, they will, they will earn the most revenue. That's not the psyche in the in the blockchain crypto community. It's about it's about the, that community atmosphere. It's about resolving things together. It's a whole nother way of looking at it. 
And I think to go into that as an entrepreneur, or if you want to start a business and, and, and all of that, I think, you, and you haven't been exposed to that, or you're of a different generation or what have you, that is a fundamental learning step that you must familiarize, familiarize yourself with. Otherwise, you're, you're going to kind of miss the boat, right? And, and, and so, so I just wanted to point that out because um, I know there was a question out there about like, you know, why should we read books uh, to, to, you know, learn how to make money? And it's not just about that. It's about understanding the, the fundamental architecture. Thank you, Shiloli. So for those that have all of the other questions, so we're going to remember that this uh, Zoom meeting will be recorded and will be safe on the website. And as a last time, you have each minute, all of you, uh, the panelists, to if the audience members would like to learn more about your organization, what would be the best way to reach all of you? So I'll say quickly, I mean, Binance US has its own website if they want to learn more about Binance US. Um, for me, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I don't think my profile is hidden. So if there are any burning tax questions, it's always good to discuss it with folks so they can reach out to me directly. I'll go next. You know, I'm always on Twitter. I think Twitter is the most the most the easiest way to access me. And I'm at C M E S I C Mezzi on Twitter. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, but I don't use those as much for, for so Twitter is the ideal scenario. I my website for my organization is wocblockchainpolicy.com, wocblockchainpolicy.com. You know, as I, as I shared, I wear another hat with the Blockchain Association. And the Blockchain Association actually has this one-stop shop for jobs. The, the Blockchain Association has represents over 50 companies within the blockchain ecosystem. And those 55 plus comp companies actually put all of their job posts things on in one platform on the BA website. So for people who are looking at, you know, a career change, want to explore crypto, or also just want to find to see what the you know career opportunities are in crypto, you know, blockchainassociation.org and and navigate to the page page with the job postings. There's I think there's close to 5,000 jobs listed on there now. I'll bring it home. Uh, we founded Crypto EQ to be a provider for research uh, and market insights on the, this asset class of digital assets. So CryptoEQ.io is the direct link for the web app. There's tons and tons of uh, articles and research and uh, signals and market information on our web app. Um, you can also find the team and I at CryptoEQ on virtually all social media platforms. So feel free to engage a member, a team member there, or uh, engage the, the platform directly. All right, that is all of the time that we have. Thank you so much for our distinguished panelists for joining us today and for sharing their expertise on blockchain and cryptocurrency. To our audience members, be sure to check the Baker Institute website for more events. And thank you so much and have a great day.